Hello everyone, I'm Lucy and I'm going to be doing the passage for today, which is John 11 verses 1 through 44 in the New International Version. Now my name Lazarus is sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness is not in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you and yet you're going back there. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, then he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but this, his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him and Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again on the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who was to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up and quickly went to him. Now Jesus had not, en not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached a place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time there's a bad odour, for he's been in there four days. Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. I'm now gonna pray for Stuart who's preaching today. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for Stuart who's preaching and delivering your message today, Lord. I pray that you open our ears and our hearts, Lord, and that you speak for him so we, we are encouraged and understand what he's saying and what you wanna tell us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Lucy. That uh, passage was quite a long one, so you did a fantastic job there of leading us through it. Uh, welcome to the Restore live stream this morning. If it's your first time joining us, then we are so thrilled to have you with us. Uh, as Lauren said, we've been doing a series called The Jesus Way, and we often talk about the truth of Jesus. And what we've been trying to do is have a, a look at some of the stories and say, but how do we live the Jesus way now that we know the Jesus truth? And so that's really what this series has been all about. The, the um, passage which has been tying it all together is come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And I don't know about you, but rest sounds like a really nice thing for Jesus to be offering, uh, particularly with everything that's been going on over the last 
uh, almost a year now, um, I guess it's eight months or something like that. It's been a lot for us to process. And today's topic is uh, how did, what's the Jesus way of dealing with grief? And to be honest, I think I would rather not be doing this topic. It feels like too big a topic to try and cover. However, it also is a topic that often gets slightly overlooked or ignored or grief gets put into a very small box. Oh, it's just about this and it, it's just this. So what I want to try and do for you this morning is open up the topic of grief uh, perhaps more than you've heard before. Uh, and then we're going to look at the story of Lazarus, uh, Mary and Martha, and all of that um, in the context of what grief is. And so I've got a few quotes and a few statements about grief to kind of frame what we're talking about this morning and give a bit of context as to what I'm going to speak into. So if the first slide comes up, uh, you can read along through this with me. Here's three statements on grief. Number one, the experience of loss is common to all mankind. Our reaction to this loss is grief. Processing grief well is critical to our ability to function. Without good process, we lose energy, focus, and the ability to connect. And then thirdly, every one of us has experienced grief. Not all of us has been taught how to respond to it. And so really want to um, kind of broaden our understanding of what grief is and who is affected by it. Because the reality is probably every single one of us is experiencing some level of grief right now. At the start of the year, I don't think anyone could have predicted all of the changes and restrictions and things that would have happened. Initially, um, different people were having a birthday in lockdown and that was a, a big deal. And the people whose birthday was months and months away were thinking, phew, I'm glad my birthday's not now. The reality now is probably we're all going to have some kind of lockdown or restricted birthday. That's how much things seem to have changed over this time. And the impact of that, the impact of these different things that we may be expected to have or that we enjoyed uh, doing and having and being part of, the impact of those things being restricted, things being missed, will cause a reaction in us. And part of that is grief. And so I want to look at that this morning. So we try and understand it. I've got two quotes for you. Uh, one's from uh, Henry Cloud and one's from Wikipedia. Um, and here they are. Uh, Wikipedia first. Grief is a multifaceted response to loss, particularly to the loss of someone or something that has died, to which a bond or an affection was formed. Grief is the pain that heals all other pains. Now that second one I think is really profound and I'll come back to it a few times this morning, but I think it's one that's worth remembering and thinking about. I don't know when the word grief or grieving comes up for you, what immediately comes to mind. It might be um, the death of a loved one or someone going through that and uh, maybe a particularly tearful response to that. But grieving is a much, much bigger thing than that and can apply to anything where there's loss and it's the loss of something that was important to you or that you had a fondness or an affection for. And so when you describe it as that, it actually could apply to a whole number of massive things. And so it's not only associated with the death of someone but it could be around all kinds of things. Here's some examples of things that because of the pandemic and COVID and everything else, you may be experiencing some kind of loss and grief over. Um, job loss or financial anxiety, um, a perceived loss of safety, uh, worry about loved ones, the impact of social distancing and the lack of ability to connect with people in that way, quarantine and feelings of isolation, Changes in habits and routines that impact our everyday, special plans or events that have been cancelled. We've had a number of, of weddings and other things that have um, been impacted in the life of our church family. Uh, clashes with family members over how to protect yourself and, and which restrictions to interpret certain ways. Um, worries about how to pay rent, utilities and other bills. Uh, sadness over how the pandemic will affect the world and fears for the future. And you could probably add in some of your own ones there as well. Um, 
I don't know about you, but I'm missing hugs with different people. Um, there's just different things that you maybe wouldn't have even noticed, but I really miss that. These are some things I've really missed. And we've got very good at adapting and just kind of rolling with it, um, particularly because there's not a lot we can do about it. We just kind of accept it and, and start moving through it. But actually, there's a lot of things happening and changing that are impacting us. And if we don't acknowledge the impact they're having on us, then it kind of simmers under the surface. Um, here's some ways that people might respond to that sense of grief or change or loss. Um, a, you might be a kind of a put it behind you and carry on kind of person. Um, there was a whole load of mugs and t-shirts and things that were keep calm and carry on. Uh, that could be one of your responses. You might be uh, option B, kind of just be strong and don't get down or sad, kind of like just dig in and, uh, and just don't show any weakness. Um, C, you might kind of try the tactic of just think only about other people. Don't think about yourself or any potential sadness, but just think about others and that will help uh, to just kind of keep going. Uh, D, think happy thoughts when sadness comes up. Sad thoughts aren't great, so let's just think happy thoughts. Um, or E, maybe um, find a way to solve the problem and get involved in the future. Uh, so processing our grief is crucial to our ability to function. And there's many things that are affected. Uh, if we can't process, we can lose our sense of energy and focus and ability to function. We talked about the impact um, of connectedness on all these things and how that was really key. In the same way, grief and the ability to grieve in a good way will impact our ability to function in these things. And maybe you're thinking, well, I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't think that impacts me. I don't think grief is the right word. I'm just feeling a bit kind of uncomfortable or tired or, or just, this is just how life is now. Um, and I want to do one more slide. I know I've used a lot of slides so far, but this is a really good one as I think it kind of sums up a lot of what I want to talk about. So it's a COVID related slide. It's actually from March, but I think it's totally true right now as well. And it says the discomfort you're feeling is grief. Fighting it doesn't help because your body is producing the feeling. If we allow the feelings to happen, they'll happen in an orderly way and they can empower us. And here you may be familiar with the five or six stages of grief. A sense of denial. No way, this virus can't affect me. Anger. What? You're making me stay at home? Bargaining. OK, so if I stick to the rules and stay at home for two weeks, things can go back to normal, right? Sadness, will this ever end? And then finally, acceptance. Now, this is real, so what can I do next? I can wash my hands, I can keep my distance, I can work virtually, and so on. And the final stage is meaning, a sense of actually, this isn't the end. I'm finding the light in the darkest of hours. And so you may have experienced some of those things in the last eight months. I know I have. Feelings of denial or bargaining or anger or sadness. And while acceptance is a stage as well, we mustn't get kind of caught in that. Well, we just have to keep going and keep going and keep going and not acknowledge some of the other things that have impacted us and affected us. The process of grief is not a linear one. It's actually one that can be gone through in all different stages at different times. It's more of a journey. And different stages can be revisited. Fighting against it doesn't help. Instead, it's worth allowing yourself to experience the emotions and the feelings that come with the different parts. If we allow ourselves to grief, then it can happen in a way that actually helps us. Helps our bodies, helps our emotions, helps our spirits to be able to heal. But grief is a significant thing. And so we're going to look this morning at how Jesus dealt with grief, how he engaged with it in other people and how he experienced it himself. And so we have the story from Matthew 11 uh, of Lazarus. And I find his name slightly ironic. The name Lazarus means the one who God helps. And here we have a story where he needed God's help and then he died. And verse one to five kind of makes sense to us because we read that he was unwell and the sisters said, we need Jesus. So they contacted Jesus. And then from verse six onwards, it, there's some things in the passage that don't quite make so much sense to us. 
Because said, Jesus heard the message and decided I'm going to stay where I am for a few days. He didn't rush in. He didn't go immediately. He didn't respond in the way that I expected him to respond reading the story. He didn't rush in. He said he loved them, so he stayed where he was. And so there's a, something of a concept of he was doing something deeper, bigger than they were expecting. And personally, I'm a rescuer, an activator. I love to get involved. If something's happening, I, I want to go there straight away and, and play my part. Um, but I've learned it's not always the best thing to do. Um, even just in parenting my three boys, um, sometimes it's not the right thing to dive in and to, to stop what's happening straight away. Sometimes allowing them time to work out and to develop skills in terms of how they negotiate and how they um, deal with conflict and situations. Sometimes the right thing is actually to, to step back and to let them work it out for themselves. And I think this passage is really about faith. And faith isn't believing in God so that you can get everything you want and kind of be protected from anything going wrong. Faith is much more about how do you trust God when everything is going well and when everything seems to be going pear-shaped? How do you relate to God in the midst of a storm? What are the things that come up to the surface? We all have situations that oppose faith in our lives and our reaction to them shows something of where we put our trust and what's important for us. I love the stories in the Bible of people like Esther who knew that God might not spare her life, but she was brave anyway. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they were told they have to bow down to an idol. And they said, we're not going to do that. And they say, our God can save us, but even if he does not, we still won't do it. It's a brilliant depiction of what it means to have faith. And so in these times, it's okay to be frustrated, angry, upset, disappointed. When we think God's going to do something, we think he's going to wade in and, and change things, and he doesn't. And that's a really hard place to be in. And that's the place that Mary and Martha found themselves in. They surely thought if Jesus is going to come through for anyone, it will be us. We're his friends. He knows us. He knows Lazarus. Lazarus' name means God will help him. <laughs> and yet he died and they were left to deal with their grief. And eventually Jesus does come. And you see the difference again between Mary and Martha. They're very different characters. Um, there's another story in the Bible where one of them works hard for Jesus and the other one sits and listens quietly to Jesus. In the same way, they process their grief differently. We read about Martha. Martha, um, if, you, if you've ever done anything in terms of um, how people handle conflict, there tends to be two um, obvious uh, types of behaviour. One is a rhino, uh, someone who will charge in and confront things straight away. The other one is a hedgehog, someone who will withdraw and put up a bit of a, a prickly edge. Well, Martha's definitely the rhino and Mary is definitely the hedgehog in this example. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. Um, that's a silly example. But we have Martha here. She charges, she goes to the gate and she meets Jesus there. She doesn't wait for him to come. She goes and she says, you didn't do what I thought you would do. But you're still my Lord. In that moment, she's lost her brother. She's grieving over her brother. Jesus has come. He should have come earlier. And she's still able to say to him, you didn't do what I thought you were going to do. But you are still my Lord. And she goes on. Um, the passage will come up on the screen. She says, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah the son of God who is to come into the world. The situation that Martha would not have chosen for herself created the opportunity 
for an incredible revelation about who God was. And it wasn't based on what he'd done, but it was based on who he was in the midst of her grief, in the midst of her suffering and pain and questions, she was still able to say, I know God, that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. It's an incredible faith statement. I'm not sure there's another one like it in the Bible of such <laughs> theological uh, soundness and incredibleness. And Mary has the complete opposite reaction. She stays at home. She can't bear to face Jesus. She can't bear to face up to the reality of what's happened. Until she's told, Jesus is asking for you. When she hears that he is asking for her, she comes and she runs to him. And a really interesting thing about it, he has stayed at the gate. He stayed at the place where Martha went to meet him. And Martha said to him, you didn't do what we wanted you to do. He waits there for them to invite them, for them to invite him further in. And eventually Mary does. She says, come and see where he's laid. And Jesus comes in and there's something about the grief and the emotion that Mary and Martha are experiencing. Jesus finally just can't keep it in anymore. And we have probably the most memorable verse in the whole Bible. It's just two words. Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. If you want to learn a Bible verse, that's probably a good one to learn. Jesus wept. And we learn from that many things. We learn from that that Jesus grieved. Jesus felt pain. Jesus was overwhelmed with different emotions at times. And that in Mary's grief, Jesus was present and he was grieving too. I don't know if you've got a situation at the moment that you are feeling grief over, but you should know that Jesus comes alongside and he weeps with you. Jesus is the God who comes near in our grief. He gives permission for Mary by grieving himself, by showing us, actually, it's OK. It's OK to weep. Some things are worth weeping over. The loss of some things are significant and we need to allow ourselves to respond in a significant way. We can't just move past it and pretend it hasn't happened. At some point we need to face those things. Jesus' compassion brought him close to Mary, where she was, and he engaged with her there. Even though he knew how the story would turn out. And the story then takes a remarkable turn because Lazarus is then raised from the dead. Jesus says, show me the tomb. When he gets to the tomb, he says, roll away the stone. And Martha's like, hang on a minute. Like, I've had a great revelation about who you are, but what are you doing? He's going to be really smelly by now. Don't do it. And it's another interesting picture of Jesus not rolling the stone away himself, but inviting others to roll away the stone because the stone and the tomb represented things that had died or, or things that maybe um, had been kept hidden from God. And so as the stone is rolled away, Jesus calls Lazarus, come out. He speaks life to Lazarus and Lazarus comes out. He comes out covered in his grave clothes. I mean, that's probably a pretty scary thing to see happen. But there's some brilliant parallels between this story and when Jesus uh, comes back to life. Lazarus is still covered in his grave clothes. This represents that he would have died again at some point. Jesus leaves his grave clothes behind because he rose knowing that he would not die again. But I think Lazarus's grave clothes also represented that he needed some unwrapping. He needed to do some things to step into the new life that was waiting ahead of him. And sometimes when we allow God in to the place of grief, the place of loss, the place where we need healing, we're not sure what that's going to look like. And obviously it can't always mean the restoration of what was before. 
but in allowing God to come close and allowing God to speak into the places in us that are broken and hurting and needing of his hope and his restoration, we invite him to breathe his new life on us and to give us hope for the future. Jesus doesn't force us to deal with stuff we're not ready to, but he says to us, roll away the stone. Show me what's dead and I will bring it back to life. And in terms of grief, there's different things we can do to respond in a practical way. Number one, I think, is that we need to recognise our own grief and begin to process it. If you can't recognise it in your own life anywhere, it's probably quite hidden. But I, again, I would say I think all of us experience grief. So to be able to recognise it is definitely step one. Number two, connect in a vulnerable way. We can process our grief alone, but actually if we process with God and with others, it will really help us. Number three, recognise and remember what was good about what was lost. I saw some posts on Facebook this morning about people saying, oh, do you remember last year, October half term, we went and did this and we went and had this. They were remembering the things that we aren't able to do anymore. Number four, being sad and saying goodbye. It's okay to be sad. Sadness is not a bad emotion. If you've ever seen the film Inside Out, you'll know that sadness actually saves the day. Sadness is the right emotion at the right time. And so being sad and saying goodbye is a really important part. And then finally, forgiving and learning to adapt. Learning a new way to live. Allowing yourself to begin to find new joys and new things to replace the past hurts. And grief is a complex topic. It's a topic that I don't know if you've spent much time thinking about before or kind of wrestling with. But I think we're certainly all experiencing different kinds of losses. And if we don't make any time to think about what's the impact of that on me, or, or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you're experiencing the discomfort or the, the unsettledness and you're not sure what it is. And yet at the same time, you haven't acknowledged that you, maybe you're feeling grief. Maybe there's things that you can't do anymore. And actually that's had an impact on you. And so I really encourage you, make some time this week, either on your own or with others. Some people prefer to process with others. Some people prefer to process on their own. Find a starting point and reach out to God. Reach out to him. And all of this is a journey for us. We want to live life lighter, the Jesus way. And we do that by coming to him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. And I think in terms of grief, we don't realise the grief we're carrying. And Jesus says, come to me. My burden is easy. My yoke is light. I'll show you how to walk through your grief. I'll walk through it with you and bring restoration to you. And God has a redemptive plan for us that we will be able to work through our own grief and then shine our light for other people and help them to walk through theirs, to show them that we know someone who will walk with us who will bring restoration and healing to us as we trust him. God offers us hope for our future and he invites us this morning to be with him. I'm going to invite the band up. I don't know where you are right now. I don't know when you're watching this, if it's a time where you have space and time just to ask God some questions. Maybe it isn't. Maybe you need to schedule that somewhere else in your week. If it is a good time, then let's just take a minute to do that now as we respond in worship. Father God, we want to offer you ourselves afresh this morning. Father, we recognise it's been a traumatic time. It's been a strange season. There's been so many things to change and adapt and to roll with. 
Father, we want to recognise the times where we felt anger, sadness, when we were in denial. We thought, no. God, help us to find that place of acceptance and meaning. And God, I pray that we will know you with us. We will know that Jesus weeps with us. Jesus comes close to us. Jesus is the friend who will bring restoration to our souls. As I was preparing this, I felt that I could feel the emotion over the last 24 hours. And it it felt like it wasn't just my emotion. It felt like it was other people's emotions. And so, God, we want to offer you our emotions. Father, thank you that we are emotional people. Thank you that showing emotion is a good thing. And I pray that you will unlock our emotions where we've locked them down. God, that you will help us to come to you as we are. And that we will find healing as we bring our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond in worship.